Um, okay, do you guys see the recording icon? Okay, cool. All right, that's great. Um, so, Gleb, maybe I'll pass it off to you and your team, and you can tell us what you're going to share. And then, um, just so everybody knows, in the second part of the call, Ricardo and I will be talking about smart contracts in Inc. Great. Let's do it that way. I will present my screen, and I will present the project we are working on. Uh, so now you should be able to see, to see my screen, and on the list of participants, you are able to see uh, my colleagues, Jakub and Andre, who actually made the project possible. So what that project is about? I'm going to present an API Explorer. It's not a substrate module, but the tool we found really helpful during development of substrate modules and also third-party applications which read on tra or transmit some events on Kusama or any other substrate network. So basically the first uh, quick introduction, how we get into it. When we just started learning substrate ecosystem and all the things around it, obviously the main point of interest was API. And API of substrate is dynamic by default, and that means it's flexible, that means it's live, and also it means it's difficult to use and difficult to understand and difficult to explore. So basically, when I'm getting first time I got the API object, I have no idea what I can do with it, how to communicate with blockchain, and what other options besides examples we have. So that's the time we got an idea of making an API Explorer, and that's exactly what this application is, to go through the dy dynamic API, look at every available endpoint and on every available operation, and learn how to use it in our code. So let's start with uh, Kusama. Uh, you see main screen here, we're currently supporting Kusama, Edgeware, and PlasmaNet. Edgeware is down, so we are not going to use it. And also custom nodes. I'm going to demonstrate how we able to explore API for Kusama, first of all. So uh, we have four flavors of API here, constants, query, RPC, and transactions. So let's start with simple query. It's pretty similar to state uh, explore on polka.apps, but on the same time, it's quite different. So we have a list of all modules. We just expose some state. So every pilot exposing state is here. And let's take a look, for example, on staking as one of the most popular. And we have the list of methods here with comments. So the difference from uh, Polkadot apps here, we have the list right here uh, with all the description. And also here you can see where we can find it in API object if we are using JavaScript code. So let's try something out. Let's say current error call. We have here description. We have here a reach on type. By the way, I believe, uh, yeah, Substrate apps does have it for chain state, but does not have it for extrinsics. So, and we can run the test. So current error is 324. Uh, we can also take a look at transactions, but we are not able to communicate from here, but because we does not have any accounts. So let's say balances, transfer. So because it is signed, we cannot test it. But we see the list of parameters, types of those parameters, which is important for TypeScript, and message, the function cannot be tested. Also, we can see it is a return as a vector of something. We cannot display of what, can display it yet, but it is vector of something. And if we will try something more easy, let's say, let's say again staking, and now oh, validate return the vector too. Yeah, here we have vectors. So where is this? Where's this data coming from, Gleb? This is like you queried the a Kusama node, and it gave you back some object that tells you this kind of data, or how how does that work? This is probably for me question. Uh, yeah, I'll ask you that. Uh, we are building on uh, Polka.js API, and part of the with 
the part which is uh, dynamic that is built from the queries from the from the metadata that uh, the node returns, and the other part, the RPC, which is fixed, that is built from the API object itself. So uh, we parse the Polkadot.js API object. Okay, cool. Do you want to say a little bit about um, like how substrate nodes are a little bit different than like Ethereum nodes or Bitcoin nodes? And like I know you mentioned that they're they have this sort of dynamic nature. So what does that mean? And like why why is it good? Why do we do it? And like what are the you know why does it make it harder? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, so basically, now we are looking on API for Kusama node. But let's do it with our own node, and I will explain it by example. So let's switch node and connect to custom node. Currently, I'm on my local host machine. I have a Substrate Kitties example running. Uh, you know, the Substrate Kitties uh, workshop from Substrate uh, Learning. It's actually really great to learn Rust and all the things about creating pellets step by step. So, by the way, keep in mind it's just a prototype, it's not a ready made product and so one of the first demonstration of its functions. So we will, we will see the different sets of, uh, of, of pellets and different set of methods. And because I have included substrate kitties pellet in my pellets of my blockchain of my substrate implementation, we have it also here. I have not tuned all color that API Explorer to understand my substrate kitties. I have not write a single line of code to make it, make it possible. It is discoverable automatically. And that's kind of difference from static APIs. I cannot rely on any, let's say, Swagger documentation to get all the APIs or API endpoints. It's, it's generated dynamically by modules on Polkadot on substrate. So uh, we can get all kitties count and we can get those kitties. And keep in mind, here is the link. We can actually, the definition address of endpoint we are calling by which we can access that endpoint in our code. So it's ready made. I also will show the code of Polkadot itself, uh, how we utilize the functions. So uh, we got the number of kitties. And let's try to get the first and only kit we have. We are getting hash, return type is hash. And the interesting thing here, we can explore endpoints which does have custom types. So kitty is not a type of substrate, it's my own term. But in the same time, we cannot test it because we does not support, we don't know definition of the type. And that's one of ideas for future improvement of the application include type import the same way as polkadot apps have. So that's basically the whole functionality of API Explorer and the way it's useful, the way it's functional. For example, a couple of weeks ago, I had no idea which API function, which API query will return me content of block. And what should I do? I just open Explorer, look through it, I believe it will be in RPC, chain, get block, and by hash, I'm getting the block. And here I have the way to address that point. And uh, please let me reshare my screen. I will share the code when I use it. Um, yep. You, now you're looking at open source uh, application Polkalert that they are building on create uh, some extra layer of information for Polkadot validators and nominators. It's open source, so I can share it. Uh, so here you see, I'm getting signed block by getting API RPC chain get block. And that's the way I'm using my API Explorer to help me build any third party, any side application. And also I'm using it to check my substrate modules how do they work and what types they reach on in addition to Polkadot apps. So, yeah, thank you for attention. And uh, Jakub, uh, 
will explain some technical details and difficulties he made during development. Okay, so was everything clear or you need, I think, yeah. So basically it's a React app and uh, we use Polkadot.js to connect to Node and we use WebSockets and uh, basically we just parse the dynamically uh, resolved object to get API description. Uh, we use different kinds of parsing for diff different functions because it's not consistent. So that might be a little bit better in the future. And we also wanted to uh, include the derive API, which is like the one used for Polkadot apps, but it doesn't have description yet and it will be really confusing for users. So we didn't include that yet. So that might be a uh, next suggestion for improvement. And right now we don't have that problem, but in the past there was like real stream of updates to Polkadot.js and it was like <clears throat> you had this like five beta versions a day and it could break your code and it, it could stop working. So right now we got promised that uh, Polkadot.js will follow Semver. So that's a relief because it will work like just by looking at Polkadot.js repo and we, we can just update the uh, API Explorer automatically and it will just work. So that's great. Yeah, I have a question for you. You mentioned um, Polkadot API has this derive functionality, and I remember encountering that somewhere. I honestly don't even remember where, and thinking, it was like an example, I think, and I was like, oh, that looks interesting. I actually don't really understand what's happening, um, which is kind of what you described. Like, do you have even a high-level description of what that does or is supposed to do? Yes, yeah, so it's basically these convenience functions that internally calls base API methods to mm -hmm. aggregate a lot of data that is useful for displaying or doing graphs or, or anything like that. And it's, it is actually used in Polkadot apps extensively. So that might be really help, helpful for new developers to use because uh, it's already done and you don't need to do that. Yeah, okay. Cool. That's a, I, I like picking up tidbits like that because it gives me something concrete to ask core devs about like, hey, people yeah. know how to use blank. Like, I'd love it if you could show me and then hopefully we'll figure it out. Yeah. So I, I know you, uh, this tool you showed us right now is called API Explorer dot Polk Alert um, dot, uh, oh, dot what, dot com or something? Yeah. Yeah, right actually dot com. So I, I thought I saw somewhere you guys posted you have like a Twitter bot for Polk Alert, or was that a different project? Or what else are you doing with Polk Alert? Uh, well, we are currently developing Polk Alert, and I'm not sure it is ready to be widely shown and discussed yet. But it's open source project sub, uh, supported by Substrate. We have a grant for developing it, so we are going we are going to finish our second milestone about sending validators all the notification but it doesn't have a twitter notification we are planning to introduce slack notification because it's not for mass consuming but for someone who want to watch specific validator and their stats and their slashes potential slashes and their games etc to make a decision about uh, moving money or unbound or bound extra or changing another validator or some any maintenance decisions. So basically the tool to help validators and nominators be more aware of what's going on with the validators. So one day we hope to present it to. Cool. Yeah, that sounds good. That, that description sounds sort of like how I was um, describing Will's SR tool earlier, where it's like a, a tool that you can use to be an informed citizen in Kusama or Polkadot. Like, if I'm going to nominate someone, I want to know how they're doing, and it sounds oh, like... Oh, it's another thing. You know, it's, there's a little confusion. Um, SR tool is not doing that. I think you mean Polka bot is doing this kind of alert thing. Is SR tool is like more to check the runtimes. 
Yeah, right. The the common where you can tell me if this is right. The the common theme that I was trying to draw is like if I'm someone who's participating in polka dot and wanting to do stuff with my dots, like participate in governments, vote on upgrades, or like nominate validators. Like these are all tools that can help me make informed. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Oh yeah. Bye, cool. Bye. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. One more thing, Will. I want to thank you about uh, for Polkabot project because it helped us to kickstart the project with Polkaworld. We learned a lot from Polkabot code about events. Oh, cool. Very happy about that. Yeah, yeah. Very cool uh, to hear that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, does anyone have questions about API, API Explorer? I was just going to say, it, it, I think it's it's good. I mean, as I've you know started looking at these things, it is sometimes a little hard to figure out what the APIs are that are available and which ones to use. So I, I can see this as being yeah. you know, helpful. I think back to Josh's comment before, it's like there's power in like the dynamic nature of the APIs, but it makes it like more difficult, I think, to get started because you're just trying to figure out, well, what what is it that I have to work with here? And which things do I use for what? So there's maybe a bit of a trade-off there somehow, right? Yeah. Maybe so, Say maybe one more thing to say is like we're uh, planning to do f more features for API explorers to like so we can compare APIs or you can quickly search for functions or keywords uh, for things you want to do. So, so example, you type block and you have everything that that does something with block and stuff like that. So <clears throat> we're trying to improve that. I think that would be that would be useful. I mean, I think you know, even when you kind of go to the crates thing and you're kind of searching for some object, you get like 50 results, and then it's like, well, which yeah. one, like, which one is it that I'm supposed to click on to understand what the functions are? So I feel like it's it is stuff that it makes the learning curve probably a little steeper, and you could help with that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Derek. Hope it will be helpful for you. And yeah. by the way, uh, guys, feel free to test it. It's located on apiexplorer.polkalert.com. I had one more question for you guys. I, you know, so last week, Gleb, I know you were here and some other people were. Um, we did this exercise where we added a custom RPC to our node. So it had like an additional feature that Substrate didn't have. And I wondered if like what it would look like to support something like that from the API Explorer. I remember that when we did it, I like even just to use Polkadot API, I had to manually tell Polkadot API like what uh, what endpoint I added or what RPC call we added. So is that that's like the same process if you wanted to have it in the API Explorer? Uh, well, not exactly because API Explorer just got the object from uh, Polkadot node from Substrate node and mm. parts everything what's inside. Uh, but yeah, you may remember I asked about uh, those RPC codes which are not exposed via a node, so they are, are in runtime, but that are not exposed via RPC. I yeah. have not yet finished uh, the hack around it to try to play with additional Kusama RPC codes runtime in, from runtime API. But maybe one day we can pick that direction and can generate node code which can access runtime API. But that's kind of ultimate goal. We really need some time. Cool. So we can start to transition toward contracts. Um, maybe before I start diving into anything specific, does anybody want to like um, request any specific things that we get to, or like any things you're wondering about contracts? Obviously, I don't know everything about contracts, but I I did some study over the past few days, and I know we have Ricardo here, so maybe we can. So yeah, I'll just open it up to like anything specific you're wondering. I, I can throw in one thing that um, I haven't looked at yet that I was going to. It would be you know how if and how contracts can interact with like the runtime basically, like so like you know calling runtime functions or you know how one would perform interactions. That would be of interest to me. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Anybody? Yeah. Else? Sure. Yeah. We are gonna be talking uh, just about that. Precisely not because, yeah, uh, a contract cannot call a runtime function, but you can call from the runtime, you can call a contract function. So we will just demo this right now. Okay. 
I would love to throw also a question, which is probably more like a feeling um, and not not a promise of any sort. Sort, but um, ink has changed a lot in the past between the first introduction of ink and the last version we saw at Sub Zero. And um, my question is actually, uh, obviously, ink will will still um, be developed and evolved. But um, do you think we reached a point where it will kind of remain kind of looking like it is today? Or do you think it could be possible that the thing changed a lot again? Uh, I think that it will not really change that much right now. Uh, there's mostly a big change in the metadata uh, because like, yeah, the UI needs to restructure that part. So as we will see it right now, that's probably not going to be uh, like just in a few months or probably weeks, uh, but it will remain kind of quite similar with the same idea, just some mm -hmm. small changes in there. But I think the, the main uh, type of macros that these using ink right now, which are uh, not the, um, yeah, it's, it's just a new macro that it's kind of experimental right now. It's much easier to learn and more mm -hmm. modular. So we are gonna like stay with that kind of macros for, for now. That's, it, it's just improving the whole experience and also it makes the code much more smaller than it was before with version one. Mm, okay, cool, thank you. Cool, okay, so um, Ricardo, I was thinking, so Ricardo's been working with contracts for a while and it's something that I haven't touched that much. Obviously I've kept up a little bit and then I did some study this week to prepare for today. So um, I almost thought it might be useful if I like give my understanding of how these pieces fit together since I also am like a uh, kind of intro level here and then you can like correct me or make additions or however you want to do that. Does that sound good to you? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so let me, I'll just take the screen share for a sec. So I'll, I'll just do like a, a little diagram of, of the node. Um, so if I think, I think about like a substrate node and there's all this stuff that goes inside the node. And so like last time we looked at RPC, that was one thing that goes in here. And then there's, you know, there's also like the consensus stuff and there's a, a bunch of pieces. Um, and then there's the runtime. And so a, I always like to say, you know, a runtime can be written lots of different ways. You just have to implement some specific API or implement a particular trait actually to make your runtime work with the outer node. And then the way that we've always written our runtimes and the way that pretty much everybody does at this point is to use frame, um, which I, I recently relearned frame stands for um, the framework for runtime aggregation of modular entities. Um, and so I think basically the modular entities are all these palettes. So we have like, uh, you know, balances and I don't know what else, like maybe democ or how about session? That's a good one that's usually in there. Um, and so then there's this thing called contracts also. Um, and so contracts is a palette just like the other palettes, but it's a sort of a complex one. It's, I, um, you know, I don't know exactly how to quantify this, but I think it's the most complex one, or at least one of the most complex palettes that's out there. Um, and basically what contracts does is it allows us to take little, so take smart contracts, which are WASM programs. So just like the runtime itself, you know, you can write your contract any way you want. If you're a good C programmer, you can write it in C and compile it down to WASM and use it. Um, but, you know, in the same way that writing runtimes is well trodden if you're using frame and maybe pretty more experimental if you're not, then writing contracts is sort of a, a fairly well trodden path if you're using this particular language we created called ink and it's a little more experimental if not. Um, and I, I will say, like, I'm not prepared to demo this, but just to kind of drive home that last point, like I remember at our company retreat back in November, one of our JavaScript devs had used this uh, this language called assembly, I think it was called assembly script, which is basically like a language super similar to TypeScript that compiles down to WebAssembly. And she got some basic um, contracts written that way. So I think it is in the, you know, foreseeable future that you that Rust or Ink won't be the only options, but they're, they're definitely still, um, still good options. And then maybe I'll just expand on RPC a little bit more here. Um, we, we talked about this a lot more last week, um, but some of these RPC things are 
sort of uh, built in and standardized. So like metadata is one that's always in there. Um, last week we added this this custom one that I wrote, and one of them was called Silly RPC, and I I called it that just because it was like a, a toy demo. And then the other one we added last week, um, I can't remember. Oh yeah, I called it Some Storage. And some storage was interesting because it connected via a runtime API to a palette that we had in the runtime. So like last week we had this thing called um, some storage. And that's not in the node we're going to be using today. Um, but I'm, I'm putting it in here just because we learned this trick where you can have an RPC endpoint, which is something that you can call from outside the node, actually take data from a palette that's inside the runtime. And the reason that that's relevant today is because contracts actually does the exact same thing. So there's a contracts RPC here also, and it uses that same trick so that we can access some stuff inside the contracts palette. And just to, to make that concrete, the reason that you might want to use this contracts RPC is because it allows you to do stuff like um, check storage values. So you can imagine you have some contract like, um, Ricardo, am I remembering right that you're going to show an ERC-21 later today? Uh, no, not right now. Um, okay, okay. So yeah, we're not going to show that. That is one a that's much okay. simpler case this time. But yeah, we are going to show how to access the uh, contract storage from the runtime and also the uh, runtime storage from the smart contract. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So I think the idea is like if your if your contract has some storage, like if we were doing ERC twenty, that would be like example of people's balances or we're probably doing flipper today, I guess at some point, or what do you have yeah, in mind? Quite similar to flipper. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So whatever's stored inside your contract, it makes sense that you should be able to read that value without submitting a transaction. Like that's what we do with our pallets. You know, I can always check anyone's balance or like see who the validators for the next session are without submitting a transaction. And so if you want to do that for something, you know, like, uh, like contract storage, then you need an RPC for that. So that's something you can do here. You can also um, like simulate contract calls. So maybe I want to, I think I want to make a call, but I'd rather check first to make sure it like mutates state and runs the way that I expect it's gonna. So you can do that through the RPC, for example. Um, and then inside of contracts, there's a bunch of dispatchable calls, and maybe I'll just um, maybe I'll just show those in the code. I forgot to mention the top level of the stack that I was drawing here, and those are the individual contracts. When users deploy smart contracts, those contracts are stored as part of this particular palette's own storage, so they live inside this one palette. Okay, so I'm in, this is the, the contracts palette. And so you can see we have this RPC thing just like we did last time. We probably won't dig into that code very much, but it's just good to, to know that it's there. And then we have um, some, some files here. And actually, even the names of the files tell us some useful things about how contracts work. So you can see there's one called gas. And so the contracts module here um, has a concept of gas just like on Ethereum. And so when, so I guess I should say this, like the core difference between smart contracts and pallets is that pallets are sort of like hard coded into the runtime. You know, if you write them at the beginning of the blockchain and then they're part of your runtime and they don't change, you know, possibly ever in Substrate, we have this cool feature of runtime upgrades so they can change then. But, you know, if you follow along with Kusama, you know that a runtime upgrade is something that like needs voted in and everything and needs kind of some form of consensus of, the people in the network, whereas contracts are different. Like anyone can write a contract and deploy their logic to the chain as a smart contract without having anyone's permission. Like you don't need people to vote on it, for example. Um, yeah, right. And so with, with pallets, if you write a, a function in your pallet, you know, you always want to make sure the people who call the functions are paying the right amount of fees. And so there's within frame when you're writing your runtime, run you can annotate your pallet functions and say like, okay, this one costs 10 tokens to call or 50 tokens to call, or you can even get more fancy and say like the cost of this is 50 times the length of the parameter list that they, they pass in. And that's all just part of the code. But with contracts, it's, it's different. You want to make sure that when we're letting anyone deploy code to the chain, you want to make sure that people who are calling that code are paying enough fees. You can't leave it up to the contract developer because the contract developer might do something like make some really expensive function that crunches a lot of numbers and say like, oh, this one just costs one token and then they deploy it with no one's permission and then your chain's attackable. 
So Gas solves that problem. Gas says, as a contract developer, you don't need to specify the amount of fees. We're just going to keep track as this thing's executing. Every time you do an operation, there's an associated gas fee, and then you just pay that gas fee. And so if you're familiar with Ethereum, that probably sounds pretty familiar. Um, there's also this one called Rent. Maybe I'll dive in there first. Um, and Rent is, is, it's been talked about on Ethereum, but it's different than Ethereum. And basically the idea is when you store a smart contract on chain, that takes up blockchain storage and all the validators and all the full nodes have to use disk space on that. And so in the same way that we pay for compute, you should have to pay for the storage that you're making all these validators and full nodes take up. So that's how rent works. And then this, I think this enum right here, we probably won't go through all the code, but like this enum tells us a lot about how rent works. And so you can see it's called rent outcome. And basically like when you try to charge storage rent from a contract, you get one of these three outcomes. And so the outcomes are, well, maybe this contract was exempted from paying rent. And that's, that's sort of the special case. You know, there might be some that don't have to pay rent. And uh, there's some reasons why that might happen right here. Um, so like, I don't know exactly what some of these mean. One of them is a tombstone, which, which we can talk about in a second. These are the two more normal rent outcomes. So like, if you just pay your, you know, if the contract has enough funds to pay its storage rent and it pays it successfully, that's okay. That's like the, the happy path outcome. And then there's also evicted, which means like, however much money this contract had to start with, maybe it was a lot and it's just been here for a while and it spent all that money on rent, or maybe it just didn't have very much money to pay rent in the beginning. So when we run out of, um, out of money, then the contract can get evicted. And so when it gets evicted, then it turns into a tombstone and a tombstone is a much smaller piece of storage. I think it's just a single hash, um, but I, I'm not totally sure about that. And it yeah, basically, that's right. Yeah. That, okay, cool. It's, it's a hash of like, I guess all the contracts code and state and everything that was in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's the case. So yeah, restoring a smart contract also involves a huge process in there, which requires just to get the same, uh, to the game exactly the same state in order to just reproduce and uh, just, yeah, get to the same hash. So at, at the end, it's, as you said, uh, a hash that just proves that it's the same smart contract. Yeah, okay, cool, that makes sense. And so then, Ricardo, is this my, is my understanding correct that I can like deploy a contract with some funds to pay the rent and use it for a while, and then it runs out of rent money and it becomes this tombstone, which is just a hash and then, you know, if we don't ever want to use it again, then fine, we won't. And all of our storage and state is, it's gone. It's just this tiny little hash. Or if we're like, oh crap, we still want to use that. We shouldn't have let it go to a tombstone. Then I can just like, well, first of all, I have to re-up the funds to pay more rent. But then I also have to supply like the whole state and code and everything. And then the blockchain. How, yeah. So how does that part work? Yeah, that's right. It, it depends. Like if it, if it got like, just evicted yeah you need to restore all the all the storage everything just to get to exactly the same state once you do that you can restore the, the smart contract uh, but yeah as you said it's probably really takes a lot of work just to restore all of this so, so that would be like a is there like a, a call inside the contracts module where you supply like the the state from just before eviction, I guess, to like restore it or how? Uh, yeah, so when it's evicted, yeah, there's a, I don't remember which one it's called, but uh, yeah, there, there's a function in that that you need to be calling in order to restore the, uh, yeah, to, to restore all the, all the, the storage and everything in there. Uh, yeah, as Josh said, it's much better to just keep the, your smart contract, which is a normal address. You just send some funds in there and you just prevent it from yeah. getting uh, evicted. I understand. It's kind of like a, it's a pretty bad scenario to be evicted, but I guess it, it strikes me that there's like more responsibility that you have when you write one of these, you got to like, you know, depending on, I guess the economic model, you got to like monitor to make sure you don't run out of funds or maybe you have to make sure that the mechanics of the contract are such that even if it gets used a lot by someone that it's always like kind of 
depositing back enough to like keep itself alive or something like this, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I, I when you asked that question, Derek, I scrolled to the the deco module block, which is where you write the dispatchable functions. Um, and this one just came to mind. It's it's call, and this is the one like after your contract's all deployed and everything, and we'll we'll go through that process too. But you can just imagine there's a contract out there that's like ready to use and people are, are using it and everything. So when you want to call a smart contract, these are the parameters it takes. Like origin is always there. That just means who's calling it. And then there's the destination, which is which contract you're calling. So it, contracts here will have addresses just like they do in Ethereum. Um, and then there's this one, which is value. And you can see it's just a balance. So like you can actually send more tokens into this contract and if I understand right, actually, Ricardo, this is kind of a question for you. Like, this value can be used in the future to pay the storage rent, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, cool. And then these are sort of like, you know, pretty familiar from Ethereum, probably. I specify like, okay, here's the most gas I'm willing to pay. And if it turns out that this call was just going to be way more expensive, then, you know, it will fail and be reverted. And I'll, um, in, in this case, what do we have here in the call, it's the value is mostly like, yeah, just some token that you're sending to the, to the smart contract. So uh, yeah, as you said, it's just uh, something that you will probably get there for paying for the storage or, or anything else. So the, for example, there's also here uh, a function that is called the bear call, which is just there. and. This function is the one that we are gonna call from the runtime in order to call the smart contract uh, executed directly from our uh, template model. So, yeah. oh, oh, I see. Okay, so so there's call here, which you just described, and this is the this is dispatchable. Like I can call this as a user, and it really, I mean, this is the whole body right here. It appears for a second, like it doesn't really do that much. What it really does is delegates to bear call which i'm assuming is like in my info module block down below somewhere and that's where the real work happens yeah yeah that's right okay cool so like okay so then you're saying if i want to write a custom palette that calls one of these smart contracts then it jumps right in by calling bear call yeah i mean w we could like just copy paste this call function because it just validates like just the origin and just uh, to sell look up in there, but yeah, we are basically just gonna call the bear call. Okay, cool. Which is the main the main one that calls the smart contract. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Um, so should we look through the rest of these, or Ricardo, do you want to do a demo of deploying one, or do you want me to do a demo of deploying one? Yeah, I mean, I can do the demo. We can. Okay, switch. cool. Maybe I'll just give you the screen share. Okay, perfect. So okay, what I did for this demo, it's like I got the node template that we have in the in the dev hub, which is just this node template. And if you get this node template, you can follow. Okay, I need to get back. Okay, you can follow the the tutorial to add the contracts palette. So the contracts palette here we have this tutorial which showed you exactly how to add the contracts palette. Once you follow this tutorial, you will have what we, what I have here, that it's just the node template um, with this palette. And for example, in this case, like the tutorial just adds you the contract palette in order to use it as the normal substrate. But for this case, I also uh, added the I need to implement the, the contract straight and everything in, in our template. So for example, I'm gonna use this node template just to show like the most basic deployment of the Polka of the flipper. So let's just build a flipper. Okay, let's minimize this. Okay, so in order to, if you follow the smart contracts workshop tutorial, uh, so the first thing we need to do is to do a cargo contract um, new flipper. And then we get there, then we need to build cargo contract build. 
So this is just building the WASM blob. Then we need to generate the metadata, which is what in Ethereum it's called the ABI. And then we are gonna deploy. I'm gonna start just my node template with the pallet contract in there. Uh, okay. So Ricardo, you, you started with the node template and then you added the uh, the contracts palette, like in a way that we've seen, like you added to Cargo Tamil and you include it in your lib.rs. Um, and then you also have this, like a, your own module in there that's going to interact with the contracts. Is that the idea? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, for example, you only follow the tutorial. It gets you to a state where you can deploy smart contracts and, and do everything like as, as normal, but you cannot like just use the, I mean, you can use it that's inside the template model, but you need to also like implement the trade in order to, to be able to access the functionalities in your template, uh, in, yeah, in your template palette. So, okay, this is just taking some time here. Takes just a few minutes, but anyhow, okay. So we can go through to the code. So for example, while that it's building, we can go, this is, okay, so this is the template. We are talking about the runtime here. So the runtime has just a few storage items, which is the full store. This one, implant, this one is using a structure that has an U32 ID and just a vector in there just to handle some data some raw data, doesn't really have that much. So then we will have, for example, just a function in there to store into our storage, the ID and the data. And then we also have a function that it calls a contract. So in order to call the contract, that's where I was talking about the bare call, which is just here. Um, so we need to encode everything in there and we also need a concept that it's called the selector. For example, uh, in this is something that we got from Solidity from Ethereum. It's also designed to use a selector in order to know which function you want to call in the smart contract. So for example, um, this is gonna be the, the metadata when I compile. So let's just see if I have, okay. So this case of Flipper, and then we need to build the metadata. So, okay, but I can also show. So as I was saying in the metadata, we have like just all definitions here. Like this is just strings in order to make it more efficient. And there's also the selectors. So for example, um, here is one selector that it's from a getter function. I'll show you this right now. Okay, so for example, we can see like the, the way the metadata is structured is like, it's using like just this value, which is the, in this case, 51. We can go to the strings and gonna remove this extra stuff in here. And if we go to the 51, we see that the function that it's calling, it's called the get contract values. So that function, we have it in our smart contract. So, okay, hold on, I have a question because you just answered, or I think you just answered something that I was wondering earlier. So I was looking, so you generated some metadata from your smart contract, which was written in ink. And like all throughout that metadata, there's like keys that kind of make sense and then the values are just integers. And I was like, what the heck are these integers? And so were those like indices into that list of strings at the beginning? Is that why you deleted the, or what was that little trick you did? Yeah, I deleted this just for the numbers here, just to see the yeah, okay. directly on the text editor. So yeah, so like down below now, like on line, what's currently line 56, or yeah, it'll be a little bit lower now. 
like line yeah. 59 it says custom name colon one one or like you can see on 71 it was like name five is that indices into this giant array of strings yeah yeah basically so just the numbers there represent the position that has the string in here okay cool and so that seems like a trick that just makes this file smaller is that right or why yeah why, yeah. yeah go ahead in theory it's just for making clear, like for the um, uh, parsing it in the UI, it's more for, for the UI thing. Okay. Uh, and yeah, as you said, it also makes it smaller because then you don't need to copy like this same string in yeah. all the places where it appears. You just yeah, put to the right. position there. So okay, it, so does this get stored on chain? Thing. Does this like JSON object get stored on chain or it, no, it's more for no, like- It never- no, it to to interact with the chain. Yeah, no. There's no way it goes to to the chain. Okay. Um, so it's it just for for the UI in order to understand the function that the smart contract has. So for example, this metadata is about the example that we are gonna be using there, which as I was saying, for example, the 51 belong to the uh, getter function, which just reads the values, and we have here in the contracts. Um, here, I'm gonna go just directly to the getter. So the getter function, it's just returns two value storage that we have. So a smart contract also has some storage in there, has some constructors. So here's like the structure function that contains in this case, just a Boolean and a U32. Those two are the values that we are gonna be reading in the from the runtime, uh, but these ones are in the smart contract. So we are gonna access the smart contract storage from the runtime, and also we are gonna be doing the same exercise from the smart contract to the to the runtime storage. So, okay, I don't want to get right now into here. So as I was saying, so in order to read the smart contract storage, we need to understand what's the function and the position that the storage like has. So that's why we, we need to use the metadata to understand how to, uh, what's the selector that we are gonna be calling. And also like we need to encode the, the values. So in this case, the bare call, what will, it will do it's it's gonna be calling just from the same address that's why we get the who here uh we need to put the we will send the the smart contract address which is just as a normal address here is as we were as we saw uh this is like just another value let me get back to the function yeah so this is the destination that's going to be the contract address. This is the value that it's just something that that's why we are putting zero in there because we don't want to send anything. Gas limit is the next and then just the data. So we have the gas limit here and we have just encoded the data. So this is will, this will basically just call the smart contract. And yeah, so what is just, in the, what's in the data? That's, it looks like you make that on 86. So that's like okay. oh, selector you told us about, I guess, right? Yeah. So basically the data is just the encoded data plus the selector. So we need to put, first of all, it's just tell them what function we are calling and then just get the two values. In this case, we are going to store a Boolean that it's the, things that we have in the smart contract. Um, so we have a Boolean in the smart contract and we also have a U32. So that's why we are encoding those two, two values, just a Boolean and a U32. And we plug everything together. So with the selector plus the first uh, parameter and then we also get the second parameter. We concatenate it and that's the data that we are gonna send. It's just gonna be a, a string. Uh, yeah, a hex, a hex string. So, um, 
yeah, that's basically how we call the smart contract. It's kind of easy. And in this case, just for an example, we are gonna get the data in in a event. So we are gonna see in the Polkot JS apps, we are gonna so we are gonna see the, the data in there. Then we, for example, have to get the contract storage. That was just for calling the, the contract. This is just calling contract. Then we can also access the contract storage from the runtime. In order to do that, there's some offsets that we need to get. These offsets are, for example, also on the metadata. Uh, we can get them. So let's just search for the offset. So the offset is something that it's used for example, here are the two offsets that we are going to be using. It's something that it's used for um, the way how the smart contracts store the data. They use a concept about sales, uh, and these sales need just some offsets in there just to be more efficient. Um, that's basically why we, we kind of have this all of these uh, offsets. So we are going to use those offsets in there and uh, just after just getting these offsets, we can then access exactly the storage uh, from, from the smart contract that it's here, it's the address. And we are gonna just send it here, just read it to the Boolean, then the U32. And we are also just uh, gonna show this in, the, in an event. So those are basically two functions that we have in our runtime. It's not really that complex. It's just calling the variable call and also then uh, just accessing a storage from an address. But in order to do that, we also need to have the offsets in order to understand uh, exactly where the, the values stand in, in our contract storage. So. Can I ask a question? Sure, yeah. Um, so is it correct to say that contracts are a layer of abstraction on top of the runtime? Um, yeah, in some way it is. It's, it kind of uses the same concepts in there. So the, the contracts also has, have the same prior, the same, um, like, yeah, it's quite similar to all the uh, features that the address has. So it's just, as you said, it's kind of a, an, a, a layer in there. So the point that I'm kind of getting at is why would, this seems like you're breaking the design pattern because you're, you're calling up as opposed to calling down the layer of abstraction. So what, what, what would be the use case for enabling your runtime module to, to access contracts in such a way? I mean, there are many cases where you will probably want to access from the runtime. So the, the way how, so that's why we cannot call, for example, from the smart contract, we cannot call a runtime function. This is just security things. It's how it remains like sandbox because we never know who's gonna execute a smart contract that we don't want to let them have access directly to the, to the runtime. In this case, we are just reading. We are not, uh, so the runtime has more priorities in terms like of storage than from the smart contract. So uh, a smart contract, uh, sorry, a runtime palette can call directly the smart contract and even um, just modify the contract storage, but and also read the contract storage. But in the other way, we can we will just see that, for example, from the smart contract, we can only read the storage from the runtime. So it's mm -hmm. kind of not really like breaking anything in there because, for example, like there are some cases where you want to execute like I don't know. Um, DeFi function or something uh, from a smart contract from the runtime when some things happen, probably a new uh, era, a new epoch, whatever. Uh, and then you just want to execute something on, on a smart contract. So yeah, it's just 
keep in mind that we are reading the the storage um, from for from the smart contract, but also like it goes just as you said, like we are we are going downside in this way. So yeah, it's it's, it's another layer, but like the runtime encapsulates all the pallets. So we are going from the outside, which is the runtime, inside the pallet contract. And you cannot go the opposite side. You cannot go from inside, which is the pallet contract, and then modify the storage from the runtime. Yeah, not the pilot, but I guess, you know, I understand what you're saying, but it, it would strike me as potentially useful to have, to be able to offer, let's say, some sort of like common services or some kind of services in the runtime that could be like, a, you know, accessed from, you know, as a smart contract developer, I could use, let's say, right? So let's say there's some common service, but I understand your point that maybe that, you know, might introduce security concerns of some, of some kind. Um, yeah. But uh, you yeah. know that seems like it would be useful, and in the reverse, it's like for the runtime to call into a contract. I mean, there's some things to worry about there too, right? Because the we were just saying the contract could, if your runtime function is relying on this contract, it could like run out of uh, rent storage or it could not be callable anymore, right? So it's almost like and you you wouldn't even know it's there first, right? So you I guess you'd do your runtime, someone would deploy a contract, then you'd runtime upgrade to reference like the contract that's been created. I guess you have to do it in that order, but in that case, wouldn't you just or maybe you might put the functions just into the runtime versus doing an external reference to uh, the contracts. I guess it, it, I haven't really thought through what the use cases are, but that's, it seems like. Um, I, I was thinking along the same lines as, as you, Derek. Yeah, because like, so we've got these constants coded in here, like maybe the offsets don't change, I guess, but the address of the deployed contract definitely is, you know, going to be subject to like what order they're deployed. Or I guess I don't really know how the address is generated, but it seems like it, it might be subject to like what order they're deployed in or, you know, any, any number of things. So I was thinking like, yeah, maybe so somebody deploys a contract, it becomes like hugely popular. And then the people who care about the chain decide like, yeah, maybe we'll go ahead and add this pallet via a runtime upgrade. So I can sort of see that. But yeah, I, I also kind of like the idea of calling from contracts to runtime because I was thinking like maybe there's, maybe my blockchain has the democracy pallet and I'm going to vote on stuff and I can't be bothered to like spend my conscious attention getting informed and casting my votes. So I want to like deploy a contract that will vote on my behalf based on some other things that are happening. Like I'm just kind of spitballing that use case, but it seems like I should somehow be able to let it call back into the existing pallets. But I, yeah, I totally hear what Ricardo is saying too. Like we can't just have it calling from root origin because then I can just call, like, I can't call anything, right? Like, sure, maybe a contract I deploy can vote on my behalf, but, like, it shouldn't be able to vote on your behalf or, like, you know, call system set code to do a runtime upgrade. So I, I wondered almost, like, if there's a way to have another origin in here where contracts can, like, uh, you know, when you do, like, you can see on line 83 on Ricardo's screen, like, that one says ensure signed, and we have also seen ensure root. Like it would be cool if it could be like ensure contract and uh, oh I guess that's oh, yeah. uh, a contract just is an address right I mean I think is it yeah just, it seems like it is an address I don't it seems weird to call it signed though I guess it wouldn't really be cryptographically signed yeah that's right yeah cool yeah that's why yeah in this case we are just taking the address from Alice or Bob whatever and just passing it directly to the smart contract so. Even yeah. like the smart contract in this case doesn't have any permission system, the smart contract, but like you just can implement like owner in the smart contract and yeah, if the one, the person that it's calling uh, the runtime function uh, doesn't have the permissions in the smart contract, it will basically just doesn't work or yeah. yeah. So it completely depends on how you implement the code in the smart contract. Cool. So, okay. yeah, in this case, there are like just these two functions in our runtime. Um, and then we can see what we have in this smart contract. So, in order, yeah, in, in order like also to understand, we are just hashing using just normal hashes in here. Uh, this is something I'm going to skip right now. Uh, 
but yeah, as I said, we have like in the smart contract, we have two storage values and we also have, uh, we need to add this uh, structure also, definition smart contract, this structure, the full one, it's the one that we have in our uh, storage in the, in the runtime. So we need to define it in both places because we need the smart contract make it to understand what's the the definition that we have in the in the runtime so in the runtime we have the full storage that has a full uh, structure and we just define the same one in here it's not gonna be stored in the smart contract it's just to make it understand when we call the function so again uh, this function is from the smart contract we are gonna read the runtime storage so we need to also do some uh, encoding here. In this case, it's more like, uh, it's not using like uh, subtrade functions. We need to do it like by hand. That's why we have the hashing functions here. So it takes first uh, the template model, which is just how it's called our storage here. Uh, and then we also take the, the variable name, which is full store, which is this one here. Um, and basically we are just appending, doing something like concatenating in the same way as we did in the other one. But in this case, we are doing it using slices and that kind of stuff. It's So after we have like our uh, final hex string, we can then also call that from the runtime, call from the smart contract and send that one to the, to the runtime. And that's just done like super easy in here because we are gonna be calling uh, a function from the environment. This is now part of Ink. So in Ink we have this environment function that are uh, just to access just like for example, yeah, in this case, the storage or like just to print some values to the terminal. Uh, in, th in order to print, this is only done in if you're running in development mode. If you are running like in production mode, it will never print to, to a terminal. So uh, we can have this function and we just send the key. So the key is what we, just created here, concatenating all the information that we have here and just send that directly. And we will get the final value, which is just uh, the structure from the uh, runtime. So we are gonna get the full store that has two fields, the ID and the data. And Basically, that's the only function. Okay, we have two more functions in here, but are just simple ones. Uh, like if you have followed the, the smart contracts tutorial, you will see like, you, this is like how to store some values. Like this flag is gonna be a Boolean and this is gonna be a U32 are the two values that we have in our own smart contract storage. Boolean and the U32 and um, this is just a getter function. It's the one that I was showing the, the selector. So for example, uh, this is just gonna read the Boolean and again, the U32. Uh, what we are gonna be doing from the runtime, it's we are gonna be calling uh, the do something function. So we, in order to call this function, we need to get the selector and we are gonna just send the two values a Boolean and just the 32. So for example, let's- Hey Ricardo, I've got a quick question before you move on. Can you, yeah, show, sure. us the, can you show us do something again? Yeah, let's go to do something. So um, my first question is just a clarification. When you said like to call this from the runtime, we need its selector. That's basically just like a machine readable way of saying the do something function, right? The selector corresponds to like that do something function. Yeah, that, that's right. It's, uh, it, it works in the same way as Solidity uh, on Ethereum. It's, uh, you need to tell when, when you are doing a transfer or just sending the data, you need to tell 
like what function you are calling. And the way how this is encoded, it's using the selector. So the okay. selector, it's basically just what we need to get there. It's yeah, just, that makes sense. Okay, cool. Like, uh, I, I think it's four bytes. Yeah, it's four bytes. Um, so you will always know when you get the all the raw string that the first uh, four bytes belong to a selector. So that's what the mm -hmm. the um, yeah the the palette contract is doing. It just takes the four bytes and then it just takes the second uh, like the I think it's thirty two bytes. I don't remember the, the second side, but after the four bytes here, it just knows that the, it comes the first parameter from the smart con uh, for the smart contract call, which will be the Boolean. And then it continues to the U32. That's why we did something quite similar uh, when we were creating this uh, smart contract, the, the call. That's why we encode, like we have the selector, which is for bytes, and then we have the first parameter, and then we have the second parameter. And all that hex string, it's basically just the data that we need to understand, uh, like the machine needs to understand in order to know what we are calling in the smart contract. Okay, cool. And so then my, my second question about like that do something call, the one in the smart contract, is that it looks like it returns a value, and that's different from how, like in runtime, functions you don't get to return a bit like yeah so like you're returning bool there um yeah. that doesn't so, really matter that much uh it's just something that uh it's really i mean i could also remove that one and just build it without that one yeah oh sure okay but i yeah i was just thinking like it's cool and so i guess my question is like are there places where I can use that value? Like, do, where would I get that? So let's say I call this do something from off chain, like I'm just using apps and I call it. Where does that bool come back to? Um, for example, in this case, it's, it, so we can read that value in there, like just to take the, here, like oh, when we do it, the call, we- It shows up though, right? In the apps, if you call it from apps, it'll just show up like as a response in the UI, right? I mean, you, you see it. Yeah, it, it shows there. Yeah, that's right. You'll see like false, true or false if you run, if you call the flipper function, like from apps. Yeah, okay. so the thing, when, when you call a transaction, uh, you don't receive any, sorry, when you call, yeah, it's, it's gonna be a transaction in this case. When you are modifying the storage, you will not receive like any, any feedback, any return value because you don't know at that point in time uh, if the transaction really uh, was able to change the storage value or it didn't. That's why uh, we need to have this getter function. So okay. this is really just like, just the value that you are passing is just um, changing the, to the opposite, okay. to the opposite side. It's really something that will cannot really uh, assure you as, yeah, tell us that it really stored the value. So we will only be able to guarantee and to know that the value will change when we call the getter. I see, yeah, that's right. So okay, that's cool. What yeah, thank you very here. So then we can start. I'm gonna skip, I was planning to deploy the flipper, but yeah, the, I mean, what we have here, it's quite similar to a flipper. So I'm just gonna skip the flipper and just deploy this one generate so this command is going to create that json file that you showed us earlier right yeah that's right okay so in this case i'm gonna close the flipper here um oh, it's company okay so in this case we are building the custom type uh smart contract it's just how it's called this smart contract the one that i uh, I was showing, it's just called the custom type. So just after getting the metadata, the one that I was showing, we can deploy it. Okay, we can start deploying. So how we do this is I have my chain that it's the no term the contracts palette, it's running there. And then when you- I think you're connected to Kusama here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to change to the local one. 
So now we have contracts here. And first we need to upload the WASM file. Okay, I'm gonna tell Alice. Then we are gonna deploy the WASM file here. So contracts, custom type, target. Okay, we already have our metadata. So we upload the WASM, we upload the metadata, which has the function that I was talking, it's really the runtime just store something in the contract storage and just read the contract storage also from, from here. So I'm gonna deploy this one, uh, upload first. So the first step in, in the contracts, it's just to upload the code and then we need to deploy to instantiate this smart contract. So in this case, now I'm gonna create an instance of the smart contract. The endowment is just the initial balance that will be kind of the reserve for the contract to pay for storage and other things. Oh, yeah. That we so, earlier. yeah, so that's right. That's the, so this value, the endowment is just, uh, as you said, it's the one that we send right now for the rent. So if this value goes like just below uh, at some point because we executed it too many times, um, the smart contract gets evicted and it gets into a tombstone uh, sure. status. So that's why I just put some extra value in there. Okay, so now from the smart contract. First, we are gonna see, we are gonna call the getter and it will, we want to see what the contract storage has and it will not have anything right now. So it's empty. Then let's just store something in there. Let's put a yes in there. Let's put a number two here and store. So we send the transaction and then we will call the getter just to, because right now we don't know if, okay, we know that it executed correctly, but like, we need to to read the values in order to really know that it changed. So yeah, we have the true here and the number two that we put it there. So the, the send is RPC call thing is that so that's like a convenience where it realizes that you can the thing you're doing doesn't need to be a transaction. You can just call the RPC function to get the same answer. Is that kind of what that is? Or? Yeah. So that that's the thing. Oh, okay. So. When you send that transaction, you will not get the return value. Uh, right. So calling the RPC, it's just an internal uh, call to our, to our node and it will basically don't consume gas. It's just reading the storage state. I uh, so it, it's like a shortcut node. versus what you said before, which is call the thing and then go to the getter of like the storage variables to like understand what happened. This kind of, kind of short, shortcuts I mean, you there. Yeah. I still need to go the getter. This is the, the getter function. Yeah. So there are like two ways how you can read the, the storage value or like just to present it to the user. So one is using the RPC call and then it show it's here. And the other one, it will print the value in, in the console. So with a, a print uh, LN or whatever we have in there, it just prints the value here. It was, yeah. it was like the previous way how we were showing it in, in another tutorial before having the RPC, but now it's much easier using the RPC just to read the, the value directly. I understand, thanks. Okay, so- Do we have extrinsic failed event if smart contract function will fail? Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. We also get the, the extrinsic value, the events in there. In this case, it was just, there was, not really much, just created the account because this is when we deploy the smart contract. But yeah, it's, as you said, it just sends the extrinsic in there. So now, okay, so we know that there's some value stored in the smart contract. Let's do the same with our runtime. And for doing that, we are gonna go to our extrinsic and then just store some values, let's use, okay. 
I need to do one more step here. So when we declare a structure that it's not defined on the, um, uh, as, as a standard one, which is the case for the full structure, we need to add it to our um, JavaScript types. So in order to do that, I have here just the JSON file that I need to add. So in order, we go to settings, this is a good thing to see in general. It's not specific just to smart contracts. I'm glad that this comes up every once in a while so people can see it again. Yeah, that's right. It's very useful. So now a new type, it's in there. And then or now we can just store a value in our store BB C. Then again, a nine here. Okay, so we submit the transaction. And then, okay, so we need to read the runtime storage. We are gonna read it directly right now from, from, from the UI. So we stored something in the, fuse, in the full store. So we see here, that it was correctly stored here. So we have the nine and we have the ABBCC. Okay, so now we know that both the smart contract and our, our runtime has both have values. So now we can go to our contract again and just read what we saw here, the runtime storage. So we are gonna execute and just execute this function which reads the runtime storage. And basically what we did here is, as we saw in the smart contract, we encoded all the code in order to read the value. So we got the nine and we got also the same storage values here. So we succeeded, we just read the runtime storage from our smart contract. Now, the other thing that we still need to know, for example, we know that we have, uh, Right now in the, in the contract storage, we have a true and a number two. We are gonna change these values from the runtime. We are gonna call the contract storage directly from the runtime. So that's why we are gonna use the selector here. We are gonna call the contract and we need the selector. So in order to call, we... Hey, Ricardo, I, I have a question. So I think I understand the demo that you just finished doing where you like used the palette to call into the contract. But I just realized, or tell me if this is correct, like the one you're about to do, this is not calling into a contract. This is like manually changing the storage without even calling the contract or no, we are still calling the contract. No, it's, it's calling the contract. So Oh, it still is, okay. Yeah, because in order to call the contract, you need to also know like what function you are going to be calling. So in this case, we are going to be calling do something. So as we have, so what are we executing right now? It's just this function here, which is the call contract. So in this call contract, we will need the selector and just to encode the two values, the Boolean and the U32. Okay, what, and what's the, I'm missing then, what, what, what's the difference between the one you just did? Like what, uh, what extrinsic did we call in the demo that you just finished with the AABBCC? Uh, okay, so in that one, we just did a normal uh, runtime storage. So the extrinsic there, what we did previously or just right now, we just called uh, this one, which is storeful. Oh, the last one didn't have anything to do with the contract. That was just a- No, that was just the normal one. And oh, then- okay. I see. So we just called the extrinsic normally, just, uh, and then we read the storage, the runtime storage from the smart contract. So yeah. what we did there is we called this function, we stored the values and then we went to the smart contract and just executed this function that read. Oh, just it was in the other. Values. It was in the other direction from I got call it. to the contract, reading back to like a runtime storage variable. Right? Oh, yeah, okay. In, in, but it was from the. Yeah. 
from the Thanks. smart contract reading the runtime storage. Now, what we are going to do is from the runtime, we are going to call the contract. So we are going to execute this function called the, uh, from the runtime. So in order to create the data that we want for the, to execute the smart contract, we need a selector and just encoded the Boolean and the U32. So in that case, again, uh, we want the function that it's, that writes to the contract storage. So in this case, for example, the 46, if we go to the top 46, I'm just gonna do the same trick here, just for showing which one. So we do something, do something in the smart contract is the function that we want to call and do something is the one that stores the two values. So in the metadata, we now need the selector because it's like the way how we recognize. So we need the selector. I have it here also, but like we just need to remove everything here uh, just to create the. The hex, so we have here the four bytes. So we need these four bytes as part of the selector here. Then right now we have, uh, what's the storage? Okay, I'm gonna check again because I don't remember what's the storage in the smart contract. So the smart contract, the values that it has right now uh, oh, uh, okay. Oh, this is just stupid thing. Okay, so I think it's a true. Um, what I'm having here. So let's call the extrinsic. Call the contract. Call the selector here. Change it to no and just put a new value. Let's put a six here. Alice, probably the smart contract is dead right now. It's tombstone, so that's why. Let's see if we can get the storage. The contract will be restored from tombstone state. Uh, that's gonna take a lot of time, and it's yeah, it's super messy. So I'm gonna just deploy it again just to show you that. Really so what happened works. is like the thing that we talked about happening happened. It like ran out of like. Ex existential kind of like balance in it to pay for storage and it, it tombstone itself. Yeah, that's what happened there. I see. So right now the thing with smart contracts is uh, that the gas and all the, the fees are something that we are still like experimenting with. We don't mm -hmm. know exactly like uh, what's going to be like the final, final value. So that's why it sometimes really consumes a lot. Uh, but all of these, it's just some values that you can modify in the, in when you are like adding the, the node template, uh, the contract palette to your template. It's something that you can just customize in there. Got it. I so have the definitions you just copying the stored in metadata or somewhere. So you won't need to. Sorry, again. What was your question, Jakob? Uh, if the type definitions you just copied could be stored in metadata or somewhere, so you don't need to copy it every time. Um, that's a good point. Um, no, I think it doesn't need, it cannot be in the metadata. Uh, because it's something specially for apps just to make it understand. But because the metadata is something that you can use in many other places. And this case is just yeah. something telling uh, for, for a specific type. Uh, and, and this type is something that lives in the runtime. It's just something that we have, we just added to the, to the smart contract in order to understand the runtime. Yeah, I think it's not the best place. Okay, probably I think my node template has some issues right now. Mm. 
Let's, oh, okay. Yeah, no, it's Bob. Let's use Bob because I think Alice is out of fonts. Oh, come on. Okay, so we have now the smart contract here. So again, I'm gonna store a no and just a number two here. Okay, and just validate this. What do we have here? Okay, yeah, we have false and number two. So we are gonna call this smart contract from the runtime. We're gonna use the selector. We are gonna put a yes and let's just put number six. So we are calling, it's, it's kind of the same that we did just previously. So we, instead of doing the manual call from the UI, we are going through the runtime. So we are just asking the runtime to do what we just did previously for storing a value in the smart contract. So it just called the store new value, or storage value, adjust and six. So then we, can go to the smart contract and validate the storage that we have here. So it was mm. just updated from the runtime. And again, just to finish this demo, so we previously had these values. So we have, I know we already did this. We already read from the smart contract the storage value. So. Yeah, I think this is just what I, so right now if we want to read, it's obviously not gonna, have, no, it's gonna have something because, yeah, it's still there because I didn't stop the runtime or, or my, my chain or. Uh, or so that part so. was just stored in your, in your palette, not in the contract. Is that yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, that's right. So here it's the, I'm reading the runtime storage because and it's still there because I never like purged the chain. It's still there. And the only difference with the smart contract, it's like the, I, I redeployed the smart contract. So that's why we have a new address and what's, what, that's why that storage was, uh, uh, was empty at the beginning. But right now it has some value that we just modified from the runtime and also, yeah. And since you, when you redeployed the contract, you redeployed the exact same contract, and so it's still read from the palette storage that was there from previously. From I redeployed, yeah, the same and the same smart contract, so it understands perfectly the the runtime storage, okay. but uh, it has a new address. So like mm -hmm. this contract has a new storage, so that's why. Uh, it was empty at the beginning, this, this, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this storage, the storage from the smart contract was empty because it's a new address. Right, okay. Cool. And so yeah, basically what we did here right now, it's yeah, just called from the runtime inside the contracts palette and read and yeah, read the uh, modify, uh, call a function to store a new value in the contract storage. And also from the opposite side, we just call that function from the smart contract to read the runtime storage. It cannot modify because of security things. You cannot go from inside from the palette contract and modify something outside. It's just sandbox in there. You mentioned that uh, you know that it would be messy, but just to talk through. So let's say in the, the scenario that happened, right, where like the the con you know your contract gets tombstone because you didn't fund it enough. You mentioned that to restore it, I guess, so the state is cleared, so it's gone from all the nodes. I guess any, so this, in this case, it's like the bool and the data storage elements are, are gone, right? They're, they're not on any node anymore. And so then to recover it, you would do what? I guess I would have the, have to figure out like what the state of those two variables was just before it got tombstoned and then try to like revive it somehow or like what, what is that? Yeah, yeah how does, that's how does right. That that's how it should work. Yeah. I see. So I, I would just need to figure out like what the state was and then there's something I can do to say, hey, come back to life. Here's some new funds to, to, uh, yep. to run on. Yeah, that, that's how we, you, you should work and just restore the smart contract. Just 
because if, if it doesn't have the same state, you will not be able to have the same hash, and it will never just, uh, yeah, just. After the session, I looked back at the code for the contracts palette, and there's this method called restore to, which does the restoring. It's not yet exposed as a dispatchable call, though. This is a pretty significant difference from like a theory, you know, this is like a, a new set of considerations. I guess if you're trying to develop one of these things, it's, you know, I think I'm still wrapping my mind around it, but this is at a minimum, I guess you need to be good at monitoring to make sure this doesn't happen to you, right? Because this, uh, it probably Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, in some way you can like do this from the runtime or like runtime and read also the, the balance storage. So you can probably have some functions in there or implement some functions in your runtime that will, I don't know, like just give some balance if it goes below some specific balance in your smart contract. So it can always have some balance in there. Right. Um, yeah, or you can have like a charge. A and, or, or I guess yeah. you have to you pass the fee on to the users, I guess, right? You have to like charge the users for using your things such that it like replenishes enough to keep it alive. Something like this, right? It's like you have to kind of Exactly. Yeah, that, that's right. So when we like, yeah, basically when you are calling, you can also send a, send some value like, uh, yeah, some tokens in there, and those tokens are just for, just keeping alive the smart contract. But you'd have to be able to chart. You, you know, if you made it optional, then I guess you're relying on people's goodwill. You'd almost want to, uh, you'd want to like, you know, have that be part of the fee of the using of your system, I guess, or something, right? So you would. Yeah. Pay. Yeah. That, that's right. It depends how you implement like the, the smart contract, how you add the the palette uh, contracts into your node template. But the, as you said, it's something the trick, that you can take into account. I mean, the trick is, I guess, because if there's dynamic data storage, then like it could be you might not even know. It's like usage of the contract would grow like the rent requirement, which would then. So it's you know this is yeah. So it's kind of a you know. If you have something where like the use the users are going to like grow the storage, then you need to account for the rent going up, basically, right? And you might not even be aware that it's or might, it's going to happen without you doing anything. Yeah, yeah, that's the main thing. So yeah, you can put some codes, uh, yeah, some costs to to the user just to make them aware that they cannot really blow your contract storage. Yeah. Yeah, it seems it seems new and unfamiliar when you're thinking about it in terms of like comparing it to Ethereum, but it actually kind of makes a lot of sense if you think about comparing it to like a Web2 app. You know, you're always going to have to pay for your servers and the disks on those servers. And so either you forward that on to your customers by charging them to use your app, or you pay it yourself, either because you're like, you know, excited about the app you developed and you're just going to pay for it, or because you're like extracting value some other way by like, you know, ad revenue or something like that. Yeah, no, that's right. It, it makes sense. I guess it's just an additional consideration as a smart contract developer. I guess you got to think through. But yeah, I can see it. It'll but avoid this kind of situation where you just have these dead projects that are just going to be around forever on these Ethereum nodes, right? Their, their data storage just like sits there forever because you're only yeah. charging on the way in, I guess, right? So yeah, yeah, that that's one of the issues that Ethereum has right now. So the storage is just growing exponentially because there are a lot of smart contracts that. Yeah. No one uses anymore, and they're just occupying some space right. in there. Someone paid once on the way in, but not for the, the carry cost, I guess, right? So, yeah. yeah. I understand. So, where we, every new node that needs to synchronize the chain needs to store that value, even if it's not used anymore. So, again, it's occupying a lot of storage that mm -hmm. doesn't make sense to have in there. Yeah. yeah. If the transactions that are used to run the tombstone contract pruned or up, or if they are like uh, still there. So, yeah. If the contract was still pruned, if the transactions used to like interact with that contract are. Oh. Yeah, so the, I mean, you're saying like, uh, okay, so someone deploys a contract, then people use it, then it gets tombstones, and now like, how about all those contract or all those transactions that they called it? Is that your question? Yes. Yeah. So they'll still be in the blocks for sure. So if you have like an archive node that has all the blocks, you can see those. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they yeah, won't be stored right. in the state. The transactions themselves are never stored in the state. You could never store state based on the transactions. 
Yeah, you're saying like in terms of restoring one, like if you have all the blocks and you replay them to recalculate the state. Yeah, yeah. You got to make sure you have the blocks though, you know, if like if if there's an archive node, great, but if not, you might have even pruned those blocks. Yeah, it strikes me as pretty bad, basically. This is like something where it probably be useful to have just some guards or service or something that will tell you like if this is about to happen to your contracts. Yeah. yeah. Or I, for a second, I was wondering, like when I was getting ready for this, I was like, oh, if I have some smart contract that's like useful, I mean, just like an example, let's say I have this smart contract that's for like gambling on the World Cup or something. You can imagine that's going to be like pretty popular leading up to and during the World Cup, but then it probably won't really be used for the next year or two. I wondered if it could be like a strategy to let it get tombstones, knowing that I'll just restore it later. But yeah, I guess you have to do like all the prep work of making sure you still have the state and so that you can definitely restore it. Hmm. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's end here, I guess. Um, big thanks to Gleb and Jakob for showing off your... Um, API Explorer and really big thanks to Ricardo too for coming on and telling us all about contracts. Yeah, thanks guys. No problem. Thanks to all. Thanks everyone. Okay, see you guys next week. Take care. Thank you everyone. Ciao. Thank you. Bye.